When I was in high school, we had a teacher named Mr. Dickinson who taught both history and government. Typically, you would take history your junior year and government your senior year, so you would have him two years in a row. When I first met him in my junior year, I thought he was the nicest person. He seemed to really be passionate about teaching, and he had a lot of patience even with the kids who are a little bit slower to learn. He let kids retake tests if they did really badly, and even got to school really early in the morning to tutor kids that were having a hard time. He was actually one of my favorite teachers, and seemed to genuinely like me. Towards the end of our junior year, Mr. Dickens' wife had a little baby boy named Matthew, and he was happier than ever. He had a photograph of his son that he would keep on his desk at all times. He would always show us pictures of him and would talk to us about the baby's first time crawling or standing up. It was clear that he was a very proud dad. But during the beginning of my senior year of high school, Mr. Dickens' whole life came crashing down around him. We lived in a small town where everyone knew everyone and rumors traveled fast. It didn't take us students very long to find out what happened and it shocked us all completely. Carol, Mr. Dickens' wife, had been cheating on him with one of their neighbors. It had been going on for years, since even before the two of them got married. As it turned out, Matthew really wasn't Mr. Dickens' son after all. After all of this happened, Mr. Dickens went completely crazy. He ended up going through their house and breaking anything he could get his hands on. He smashed their furniture and broke some paintings that had been in Carol's family for generations. The police ended up having to come and calm him down. Carol filed for divorce and Mr. Dickens had to move into an apartment. He wasn't allowed at school for a while, and we had a substitute teacher for nearly a month. The rumor was that he was in a mental asylum, but I have no idea if that was really true. Then, on one random Monday, Mr. Dickinson came back to school. The picture of baby Matthew had been taken off his desk, but that was probably the smallest thing that had changed. Mr. Dickinson had become a completely different person. He had cut off his long, hippie-like hair and shaved his face. Instead of his nerdy graphic t-shirts he always used to wear, he wore a long button-down shirt and slacks. His laid-back smile was gone, and he had a harsh, mean attitude. He yelled at us for little things, like needing to borrow a pencil in class. Strangely, he was the meanest to the girls. I worried if his wife cheating on him had made him hate all females. I felt like I couldn't even make eye contact with him without him screaming at me. I did my best to blend in with the rest of the class and go unnoticed. It was sad how much he had changed. It was as if his old self had died and been replaced with this other person. One day it was close to finals time and we all had to do a final project for government that we would later present to the class. We were all hard at work on our projects while Mr. Dickinson sat at his desk grading papers. He was in a particularly bad mood that day, so we were being careful to be extra quiet while working on our laptops. We were only a few minutes into class when the lights went out completely. It was a stormy day outside, so very little light came in from the windows and the room was dark. After a few minutes, the principal got on the intercom and announced that there was an electrical problem going on and we were out of power completely. They didn't know how long it was going to take to fix it. We were all supposed to go on about our business as best we could in the meantime. Of course, in our class we were using laptops and without the internet, we couldn't get any work done. This completely enraged Mr. Dickinson to the point where he began screaming at us as if it was our fault. He threw a chalkboard eraser across the room and nearly hit a kid. We were all just staring at him in silence as he screamed, too afraid to move a muscle. It was clear to me that he had lost his mind. We needed to get help right away. Mr. Dickinson was swearing at us and his face was completely red. His eyes looked crazed. I don't know what came over me, but I felt the need to speak up. Mr. Dickinson, please, don't you think you should calm down? He walked over to me, glaring at me with a look of complete hate. Before I could even react, he slapped me right across the face. I burst into tears immediately and several kids jumped out of their seats. The biggest guy in the class, a football player named Mark, put himself between me and Mr. Dickinson. They were starting to stare each other down. Mia, go next door to Mrs. Riley's class and tell her that Mr. Dickinson has lost it and we need police in here, Mark said calmly to the girl sitting next to me. Mia jumped up to do this, but before she could, Mr. Dickinson ran to the door. His mood suddenly changed. 
It was like he realized what he had done and now was scared about what was going to happen to him. He grabbed a trash can that was filled with paper and set it down in the entrance of our classroom. He then took a lighter from his pocket and lit the paper on fire. Before I could even process what he was doing, he dumped the trash can over, causing the burning papers to fall onto the carpet. He then walked out of the classroom and locked the door behind him, trapping us inside. Complete chaos broke out in our classroom. The fire was spreading quickly because of how much carpeting was in the room and there were several people trying to put it out at once. Someone called 911, screamed Mia, but we weren't allowed to have our cell phones on us during the school day. They had to stay in our lockers. What about the landline? Someone asked, gesturing towards the cord phone sitting on Mr. Dickinson's desk. The power's out, remember? I'm not dying in here, Mark said. He jumped over the flames and began shoving his body into the door over and over, trying to break it down. A couple of his football friends joined him, but our walls had recently been reinforced as a safety precaution in case that we had an active shooter somewhere in the building. I would have never thought that our biggest threat would have been right inside the classroom. We were screaming for help, and we could see through the glass in the door that a few kids were gathered outside. They were trying to open the door for us, but of course they didn't have a key. Go get a teacher, Mark screamed at them. By this point, the entire room had filled up with smoke and it was hard to even see where we were going. We were all coughing and it was getting harder and harder to breathe. I knew we were running out of time. The flames were getting out of control at this point and I had pressed my body against the wall to try to get away from them. Mark was still working on getting the door down, but wasn't making any progress. He was getting tired and running out of breath. We need to break a window, I screamed. Everyone seemed to agree with me and we began throwing anything we could find into the window trying to break it. It was a lot stranger than it looked and nothing was working. Finally, Mike told us all to stand back. This was a hard thing to do without literally stepping into the fire. I screamed as the flames touched my ankles and arms. I couldn't get away from the fire anymore. Mike took a heavy metal desk, picked it up over his head, and threw it into the window. The glass shattered instantly. Now we had another problem. We were on the second story of the building. If we jumped out of the window, we would definitely hurt ourselves, but at least now we had some fresh air. All 15 of us were packed around the window, doing our best to keep breathing. What can we use as a rope? Someone asked. They had to practically yell to be heard through the cackling of the flames. We ended up using the only thing we had, our clothes. We began tying hoodies and coats together, but it still wasn't long enough. The guys started taking off their shirts and adding them to the makeshift rope. Not having enough oxygen was beginning to affect me and I felt like I could pass out at any moment. I sank to my knees, not able to hold myself up anymore. I'm going to die, I thought to myself. And what a terrible way to go locked up in a fire that my deranged teacher set in order to kill us. The guys were tying girls to the rope and slowly letting them out through the window. It didn't stretch all the way to the ground, but they were able to jump the extra couple of feet. The plan was to get all the girls out first and then the guys were going to go. Where was the fire department? Hadn't someone from the school office called for help yet? My thoughts were getting jumbled and it was harder and harder to stay awake. I felt like I was in a bad dream and things were moving very slowly around me. I could feel someone with strong arms picking me up off the ground and placing me down close to the window. Through the smoke, I could see several guys working on tying the rope around me. They were all coughing like crazy. The next thing I knew, I was being slowly lowered to the ground. The cold air felt so good against my skin after spending so much time so close to the fire. I didn't know how the rope was staying together. I was sure some of the clothing had to have torn by now. I was shocked when my feet touched the ground. Mia and a couple of the other girls were untying the rope from around me so it could be lowered back up again. I finally heard sirens in the distance and knew that the fire department was on its way. Kids were everywhere, running and trying to get as far away from the building as possible. There was a fire truck after fire truck and a ton of ambulances. Mia was screaming out to get someone's attention and help me. Finally, some paramedics with a stretcher made their way over to me and began helping me. They put an oxygen mask over my face and I slowly began to breathe a little bit better. 
They put me onto the stretcher and loaded me into the ambulance. I couldn't talk because the mask was over my face, but I could hear everything that was going on. Did they catch him? I heard one of the paramedics ask. No, he's completely missing, someone said. My heart sank as I realized that Mr. Dickinson might actually get away with what he did. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed and my parents were on either side of me. I looked out the window and saw that it was already dark outside. A lot of time must have passed. I looked down at my arms and legs and saw that there were bandages on them. I realized that I must have had burns underneath them. I turned to my parents and asked them what had happened after I passed out. They said that other than needing oxygen and getting the burns, I was going to be okay. My throat was sore and I knew it was from breathing in so much smoke. I then asked my parents what happened to Mr. Dickinson. They told me that after setting the classroom on fire and leaving us all for dead, Mr. Dickinson had driven home, gotten a gun, and shot it in his head. He was dead. I was shocked, but also relieved that he wasn't going to hurt any of us anymore. I then thought of the rest of my classmates, all the guys who had put my life before theirs and helped me get out the window when I couldn't. Did they all make it out? My parents looked at each other and I could tell something was wrong. My mom took my hand in hers and told me that sadly, there was one person that didn't get out in time. They had passed away before the fire department was able to get to them. Who was it? I asked, my heart pounding. It was Mark, her voice so quiet that I almost didn't hear her. He helped everyone out of the window, but there was nobody left to help lower him down. I started crying immediately. I was crushed and felt more guilty than I ever have in my entire life. Mark had died saving all of our lives. I was only alive today because of him. He had sacrificed his own life for his classmates. For months after, I felt like there was a giant hole in my chest. I felt guilty for enjoying anything, even as simple as music, because I knew that Mark now couldn't. Years have gone by, but I still wake up screaming in the night when I remember the smoke filling the room and the flames burning my skin. The flashbacks are terrible, but at least I'm alive. If you liked this story, check out our new other video on Anna Horror, three true Instagram catfish horror stories. It's guaranteed to send a shiver down your spine. Sleep tight.